Hello, my name is Sarah Myers, and today's date is Tuesday, November 8, 2011. I am interviewing Specialist Alex Schaefer at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, about his life in military service. Can you tell me your full name? Uh, it's Alex Michael Schaefer. Can you spell your last name for me? Uh, S-C-H-A-E-F-E-R. Where did you grow up? Uh, in Lorain, Ohio. Is that a big town? It's just a suburb of Cleveland, oh. right near like Erie. Is most of your family from that area? Yes. Do you have a large family? Not really. You're Not small? too big. Was anyone in your family in the military? Um, I have an uncle that was prior enlisted. He's retired. Did that influence you at all? A little bit, I think so, to join there. Do you remember where you were on September 11th? I was in about seventh grade on September 11th. Anything stick out to you? No. Um, I was in a history class, and so we just watched it on TV, watched the news, and then pretty much went home after that, closed down the school. And Do you remember how you felt when you saw the towers being hit? I was still very young, so I'm not, I wasn't really exactly sure what was going on. But, I mean, I, I understand it, you know, like, that, like anger. I think a lot of people were angry about it. A lot of people didn't understand, I think, what was exactly happening. What was high school like for you? I mean, it was fun, good time. I played sports through high school, did a lot of stuff, activities during high school. It was a fun time. What sports did you play? Um, football, wrestling, track, powerlifting. Quite a few. What influenced your decision to join the military? It's something I always wanted to do since I was a little kid. I've always just wanted to enlist and serve our country and be in the Army. When did you know for sure you were going to enlist? Uh, about my junior year of high school. What was the main reason that you had for joining the military? Like I said, it was always something I wanted to do. Uh, my uncle was, and he was a big influence to me. And I just wanted to like serve our country. I think that's something people should do after when they're old enough. How did your family react to your decision? A lot of mixed emotions. Scared, happy, proud of me, all the above. How did your uncle feel about it? Proud. What were your experiences like in basic training? Basic training, um, it was a lot of different experience. It, it teaches you a lot. You learn a lot in a very quick amount of time about yourself and about the military. Do you remember what your feelings and thoughts were on your first day? <laughs> a lot of moving parts, a lot of stuff going around you that you don't really understand yet, but later throughout basic you understand the importance of it. Can you give me some examples of what was going on? Like you get there, you start getting yelled at, and running with your bags. You don't really understand where you're going or know the place where you're at yet. And then everything's just a rush from there out throughout the whole, throughout the whole week. The first week is pretty much just running everywhere. How long did basic last for you? Uh, I went what's called OSATE training, one station unit training. And so it was 19 weeks total. What did you do in that training? Um, for military police training, it was nine weeks of basic and then ten weeks of military police training. What was the most important thing that you learned at basic? Pretty much how to work as a team to accomplish a goal versus just individual tasks. Can you run me through a typical day of basic? Yeah, you wake up early, you get a um, shower, shave, then you um, pretty much go to eat chow, that first you do PT, then you go to get child, you know, it's quick. And then throughout the day you have different taskings and whatever training is for that day. Break a gun for child real quick and then go back into training. And then sometimes, depending on what cycle you're in, you have another PT session afterwards. And then it's like lights out around 20 hundred. Can you give me some examples of what the training was? A lot of uh, basic soldiering skills, how to shoot, how to PT. There's a lot of, a couple of things that stand out. There's a confidence tower in basic training where you, um, climb ropes, slide down ropes, you uh, repel off a wall. That's a fun day. A lot of weapons training. What was the most important important lesson you learned from your drill sergeants? Like I said, the biggest thing they teach in basic training is pretty much teamwork, being confident in the people around you and your equipment in the military. Do you have any role models who are officers or NCOs? I think you could pretty much learn a lot from anyone, senior enlisted. Uh, my squad leader that I deployed with, he taught me a lot over the last three years. He was my squad leader for three years. 
and my team leader for the last year. He has taught me a lot about developing in the military. What was his name? Uh, Sergeant Edkin, and then my team leader was Sergeant Hayes. Oh, he's the one, your friend who's here? Yes, he's here with me. Why were these people role models? Like, what characteristics did they have? Um, they taught me a lot. Like, when you first got a basic training, you think you know a lot about the military, but it's still really confusing to you. And I think Sergeant Edkin was pretty much there to, to mold me into, like, being a soldier exactly how I was in basic to get out. And then he had to, like, teach me the ropes of the military instead of just how to shoot, move, and communicate, like actually developing a soldier and develop my personal career. Taught me a lot. We deployed together. He brought us all home safe, so that's a big thing. Where did you live while you were in basic? Uh, Fort Leonard Wood. Okay. What did you do in your spare time? No, there's not much spare time, but I like to phone home or call home, write home. Um, that's pretty much it. So once you were done with basic training, what was the first unit you were a part of? The 512 MP company. What did you do while you were in there? Um, when I first got there, it was we did a law enforcement duties, which is pretty much just being military police on Fort Leonard Wood. And then we did a lot of training there. That's who I deployed with, too. I'm still in the 512 today, so now we're back to doing law enforcement duties. Was there any specialized training required for that job? For the deployment or for the for uh, the first unit you were part of? Yeah, um, law enforcement training. You There's like an annual training for that. You go just to refresh and all your training. And then for the deployment, there's tons of training you have to go through. What was your reaction upon hearing you were going to be shipped overseas? I was excited. How did your family feel about it? I think pretty nervous, pretty scared. Did you have any expectations? Of? For going over when you were going to be there? No, I mean, you go through a lot of classes, like I said, a lot of training, and they get you pretty ready to go over there. Um, Expectations-wise, it wasn't exactly how I expected. There's a lot more, it's a lot overdeveloped than I thought. A lot of more civ uh, civilization than I would think in Iraq, but. What was the specialized training like for deployment? Um, we actually went to Oklahoma to Camp Ruber, and it was just like a field cycle for us doing our military police duties, training up on weapons, on gear. We got all new gear for the deployment, uh, new vehicles for the deployment. Can you give me any specific examples of the things we did? Why we were training? Yeah, training wise. Um, ranges for like machine guns. That's that was because I was a gunner when I deployed, so I did a lot of shooting, a lot of maintenance on trucks to get ready because it's a long year on vehicles and all your equipment. Um, like I said, we had to get trained on all new equipment, even new vests, the smallest things you know, trained on, and then just tactical TTPs like field training. How did your training change when you got to Iraq, or did you, did it change? Yes, um, I think a lot of like, we didn't really know what to expect for the city we were in in Iraq. And I think that being in a city versus just a desert changed a lot of everything we did. I see that. How long did the training last before you went over there? A long time, <laughs> a long time. Probably the better part of a year, I'd say. Yeah, that was quite long. What preparations were given regarding Afghan culture and the IED threat? What preparations? Yeah. Um, each unit, each individual unit has their own TTPs they like to follow. We did a lot of training on IDs. Like you said, that's a huge threat. I was actually in Afghanistan, but in Iraq, it's a huge threat also. And we did a lot of training on that, just how to react to them, where they would be, what to look for. How, what what was the training like? What do you mean? Or, um, did they have any specific types of training that they put you through? Yeah, there's an actual uh, fake vehicle. It rolls over to simulate if you were to get hit and your vehicle rolled over. There's just, it's like I said, certain TTPs each unit has to just do their own thing for it. When you arrived in Iraq, what was your MOS? Uh, MP, military police. And when you stepped off the plane, what was your initial reaction? I was pretty nervous once we got there. It's pretty gut-wrenching because we train and train and train, you know, but until you actually get there, you don't know what to expect fully, and so it was pretty surprising to me. How did the locals react to your arrival? Um, where we were at, they had a pretty f uh, friendly, 
pretty friendly locals. We were we dealt up north in Iraq a lot, and they were pretty welcoming to us. I wouldn't say I don't know if welcoming is the right word, but they kind of understood. We've been there long enough now. By the time I was over there, they kind of understood where we stand and what our job was, and they kind of didn't really bother us too much. Where were you stationed? In Iraq. Yeah. Um, in Kirkuk. What was distinctive about the area there? Anything it's a very mixed culture for Iraq, very uh, mixed beliefs there. Also, like I said, it's a, it's a city there. There's buildings, there's towns, there's all kinds of stuff there that I didn't expect to be there. Was the climate or seasons different than you expected? The rainy season. I was not expecting that. It rained a lot there and it rained hard, and then it just switches straight back to being hot again. Did that affect your unit in any way? Not a lot. It didn't really alter any missions or anything, which is, was a surprise to me personally. What was base life like in Iraq? Uh, we stayed pretty busy, actually. Uh, there wasn't much downtime in Iraq. I mean, when we did have spare time, I, I was enrolled in college courses, so I did that, and then I went to the gym. I mean, it's not like here where you can just up and go, you know, you're pretty much sheltered there, so. Can you describe a typical day for me? Uh, pretty much, depending on the mission, each day was different, but pretty much what you would do is get up, wake up, get your trucks ready, you know, do all the proper stuff you got to do for mission, training, and up on what you're doing, get a mission brief, go on mission, when you got back, you know, refuel trucks, uh, get everything ready for the next day, pretty much. What was your typical mission like? Uh, I was with the lieutenant colonel, pretty high-ranking officials, and we would escort them a lot to different meetings throughout the town to do their higher-up uh, leader engagements. Were there any religious groups on base? Yes, there's um, pretty much any religion you want to follow. There's In the military, there's a way to do it. So you just have to go out and actually do it. If Did you, you ever practice. attend? Um, yeah, I, I would go to church sometimes or talk to chaplains. What were the basic weapons and major items of equipment you used? Um, like I said, I was a gunner, so I had a gun that was called a 240 Bravo. It's a heavy machine gun. Then I had an M4 also, which is a rifle, and then a 9 mil pistol. Were there any shortages or maintenance problems with any of the weapons or equipment there? No. Why do some people say that MP stands for multi-purpose uh, rather than military police? Because we have a wide variety of duties. There's a lot in each day for us. Like, like I said, when we're here, we're doing law enforcement while we're training. When we were over there, we probably did four or five different missions depending on where you were stationed and what you were doing. So there's a lot that goes into being MPs. Can you give me some examples? Like I said, I was like on a PSD mission. I was with lieutenant colonels and higher above officials. Um, also, while I was there, though, I trained for with IPs and taught them pretty much basic law enforcement duties. Also, while I was there, I did like a, it was called a KPOC. It was like a response unit to major crimes in the city. So that was just me personally. You know, I was doing three different missions in a year's time versus if, you know, other MOSs, they just go there and do the same thing for a year. Which mission did you do more often than the others? The PSD mission. What steps are taken in training Iraq police? Pretty much just bringing them up to speed. Um, civili civilization there is a lot different. So, like, they, we have to, like, take that into account that what you would consider normal everyday tasks, they might not know. So you got to break stuff down to their level so they can understand it in order to do their jobs. Was it very difficult? Sometimes, yes. A lot of them, since we've been there so, so uh, long now, they understand a little bit of English, they know what we're doing, but you still get some that don't understand any English, you can't communicate with them, and if you have a bad interpreter or doesn't, an interpreter doesn't fully understand his job, then it's hard to communicate with them. Can you give me a month-by-month -month summary of your unit's actions? Mm, not so much. No. Like, I don't understand what you mean. Well, Since you were there for, from 2010 to 2011. Right, we got there in there. February and we were there until February 2011. Any major events that happened or that no, you were I mean, involved in? Not so much. Not anything that stands out. Like I said, it was just a year of doing different missions and I don't really know the time frame for them. But okay. Do you think that you saw a difference in the Iraqi police from the time you were there to the time you left? Yes. In what ways? 
Um, we actually had a couple ranges with them where they actually got to use their weapons, and we had classes where they learned how to clean their weapons. I think that was a big thing. Um, they have a lot of shortages on their part of equipment, so it's very important that they know how to use their equipment. And I think that was a huge role for us that like we actually got to teach them how to shoot and how to use their equipment, uh, how to maintain their weapons, how to actually wear their gear instead of just having it. I think that'll make a big difference for them. How did your unit evolve to meet challenges you met while you were over there? Um, I would say that was a big part on our leadership. We had pretty uh, seasoned NCOs over there. They had been there a while, a couple times before. They knew what to expect, and they trained us very well, I think, for it. Can you give me any examples of good leadership you saw? Uh, just reacting, being able to make uh, corrections on the spot, react on the spot, quick thinking, and that's all I can really say. Like, I don't know. How often were you able to talk to your family and friends? A lot. Um, with, with all the technology advances and stuff, you know, they have internet over there now. So on a personal computer, you can download Skype and pretty much whenever you get free time, if you wanted to, you could talk to them. So how often? A week or so? A couple times a week, I'd say. Two or three times a week, I'd try to call home. Did you mostly talk to family or friends or a yes. mix of both? Uh, both, yeah. How were ho holidays celebrated over there? Uh, each one's different. Lit like minor holidays, you wouldn't really, they don't really celebrate at all, you know. And their culture is very different, so you got to be careful what you do, too. You don't want to offend anybody. But, um, like, I think for Christmas, we just, they had, like, a big dinner in the chow hall, and we got to play a flag football game on the fob and stuff. Uh, Thanksgiving was, like, the same way. There was a big dinner. That's pretty much it. I mean, there's not too much you can actually do for activities, but. Was the contact you had with your family different during holidays or pretty much the same? I would say yes because um, everybody wants to t call home on, you know what I'm saying? They, everybody wants to talk to their family on holidays and days like that. So I think we pretty much had a lot more free time during the holidays to be able to do that, to make sure everybody got to call home and let them know how stuff was going and they were doing all right. Did you have longer time to talk on those days? Yes. Were the meals different? No, the child hall's pretty advanced there. I mean, you know, you're eating at the same place for a year, so that is different, but there's I really can't complain about that. It wasn't too bad there. Did you ever witness action during your tour? Minor. Minor action, yeah. yeah nothing big? No. What traits do you believe make a good leader? Uh, discipline, like I said, being able to make quick decisions, quick corrections. Uh, loyalty is a big one. Be able, to be able to be loyal to all your soldiers and pretty much just learn your job and be able to adapt to situations. Did you have many leaders that exhibited those? Yes. Were there any other instances in Iraq that you did things differently or that stood out in your mind as um, pretty big actions? Was yeah. it mostly just leaving um, secretaries and people of importance from place to place? Yeah, that I mean, there was, like I said, each day there's different. We go to different places. We were traveling a lot. We made, like, we would travel anywhere from, like, 15 minutes to two hours a day in the convoy. So, like I said, each mission was different. Each day was different for us, which is kind of good, you know. You can't get really complacent when everything's changing. But not too many major events that, like, anything that stands out too ridiculous. So you didn't have any problems with going from place to place with them? No. Not usual. When and how did your operation terminate then? In uh, February. We just, in February we do what's called a RIP cycle, and pretty much what we did was just train the oncoming MP unit that was replacing us for about two weeks, and then fly the Kuwait out of there and then came home. Was the operation executed as you had planned? Yes. Yeah. Were there any, when you look back on it, were there anything you saw that you could have done differently or better, anything? Not too much. I mean, like I said, there's a lot, you know, a lot of things do happen down there and a lot of events that did happen during our year, but you just learn from them. I want to say we would do them different, you know, you just learn how to react or what to do, you know. What was the reception like when you arrived back stateside? It was good. Um, they had a little ceremony for us when we 
I got back to Fort Leonard Wood. I uh, got a couple of days off to spend with our families before we had to go back to work. And I think everybody is just pretty relieved. What was the transition like back into a garrison? It's it's a pretty long process. Like you go home, after we were home, like I said, we had a few days off. We went back to work for a couple of weeks, took uh, two weeks of leave, back to work for a couple of weeks, and for like, like two more weeks of leave. So you get a lot of time to spend with your family when you first get there, a lot of time to do personal things, issues you have to deal with. And then like going back to work after that, like they ease you into it is what I'm trying to say, I guess. Like, Was it hard to move from being in Iraq and in that type of situations to be back in the garrison? Um, somewhat, yeah. It's just a way different atmosphere. Was it at all hard for you? Or? Yeah, a little, I'd say. Yeah. Do you prefer being in a garrison or deployed? Um, I mean, I obviously like being here, you know, but I do like field training more than I like being in a garrison, you know. Mm. When did you begin studying at Central Texas? Um, about two years ago. And at what, are you a junior or a senior there now, or is it different? Um, it's just online courses I'm taking, so it's, I don't know what year it would be technically, and yeah, I'm working, I don't, I'm working towards an associate's right now, and eventually when I get a bachelor's in exercise science. So is that what you're studying? Yes. What, how do you plan to use your degree when you finish? Um, either in personal training, I, I'm really interested in that, in personal training, and also just Eventually, I'd like to be like a, own a small gym or something like that. Do you, when do you plan on finishing with it? Um, I don't know. I plan on re-enlisting as of right now in the military, so doing a couple more years. And I would like to, you know, obviously I'd like to finish my degree as quick as possible between work and going to school. But Do you know what you're going to be doing after this? You said you're going to Korea, I believe. Yes, next year, early next year, I'm supposed to go to Korea. And you don't know what you're doing there? Not yet. No, it's still very vague. When is the time where you have to re-enlist? Um, April. What is it like being a soldier in an all-volunteer army in the current climate? I think it's good because everybody wants to be there. You know, everybody volunteered. They don't. It's not like anybody was drafted, so they don't really have much to complain about. They volunteer and they gotta do their duties now, you know. Do you do you like the climate and everything there? I do. You're, are you a combat unit now? Or you we're both, you're honestly. Both? Like, we're a force combat unit, so yes, we are a field unit. But like I said, we're doing a law enforcement job now because we just got back from deployment. So like, we go through cycles. We have road cycle, training cycle, and then like a deployment cycle. Right now, we're on our road cycle. What do you What do you do with those during those? The road cycle is pretty much law enforcement duties, like I said, here on Fort Leonard Wood. And then the training cycle is all the training, field training, just getting pretty much refreshing or learning new stuff, new tactics. And then, like I said, deployment cycle, whenever that time comes again. How has the military service changed how you serve and look at your community? It's a lot different. Like, you know, you grow up and you're comfortable where you grow up and you learn how to adapt there. and then your whole outlook on life pretty much changes once you're in basic training. Like, you notice a lot of things different. I think there's a lot of different standards, personal standards you hold for yourself. And it, it changed a lot of my views on where I grew up, I think. Can you give me any examples? Uh, just, you know, you, like, people you think will be your friends forever. You don't really, you can't really socialize with anymore. They don't really relate to you as well. Um, just stuff like that, you know. Going back, a lot of personal, like, issues that you have with yourself, maybe like how you hold yourself to a higher standard or what you want to do with your life or you have ambitions now. And if some of your friends didn't from back when you are there, you know. Like when I go home, a lot of people aren't doing much with their lives. I think it's like hard for them to relate. They don't understand like the military term, how you like trying to progress or trying to do stuff. Does it change the way you vote or do volunteer works or anything? No. Not really? Well, before we close, is there anything about your life and military career we haven't talked about that you would like me to know? Um, not really, no. No. Well, on behalf of myself, my family, and Ball State University, I want to thank you for participating in our project, and thank you for serving our country. All right, thank you. Thank you.